Hi everyone, welcome back. So I have to remind myself once in a while that we're not just here for the RV10. And over the last couple of weeks, there's been a couple of topics that have come across uh, my mind uh, through some uh, experiences. And I thought it's time to revisit those again. So uh, we'll give you a quick update on the 10, but uh, let's talk about some of those other things first that are quite serious actually. So most recently had another friend who had a engine firewall forward fire during start. It was an RV-10 and unfortunately grabbed a fire extinguisher to put it out. Now I've written about this and I think I may have done a video or two in the past, but I want to remind everybody again, it's really, really important around aircraft to have the right kind of fire extinguisher. So I've got three sitting here in front of me. If you look at this one over here on the right, this is what you'll typically find when you go to Home Depot, Walmart or something to stick around your house your basement, your shop, et cetera. Notice it's an A, B, C fire extinguisher, okay? No way, no how do you want this fire extinguisher anywhere near your aircraft. And really, you should only have one of those in your shop and not near an aircraft. Uh, they're good for electrical fires and you know other kinds of fires, paper, you name it, uh, fuel fires, but if you, use one of these around an aircraft, the fine powder that comes out of those things is extremely corrosive to aircraft, especially the aluminum and metal pieces. I'm very much aware of at least three aircraft that were uh, actually had fires and they used this ABC fire extinguisher and those aircraft were totaled because you cannot get this dust out of that aircraft no matter how hard you try. And an aircraft, once it starts flying, you know, there's a lot of breeze and wind in there blowing all this little fine dust around. It's finer than the fiberglass dust that you get when you uh, sand fiberglass. It just gets everywhere. It'll get in your avionics, start to cause intermittence over time. The most corroded airplane I've ever seen, I think I wrote about, might have been Sport Aviation, was a ABC fire extinguisher had been used. And underneath the seats, it looked like that aircraft had been submerged for a year in salt water. It was horrendous, okay? So that being said, what should I have? So one of two types. In the shop, in our hangar, near the exit of the hangar where the airplanes are, a CO2, carbon dioxide fire extinguisher works. You want a nice big one like this. And you know, we hang it on the walls at each exit to our hangar here, and would recommend you have those in any hangar that you have at an airport. For inside the aircraft, this is kind of big to haul around. Normally what I do, you can get these at aircraft spruce and probably fire uh, supply houses. This is a halon fire extinguisher, okay? It extinguishes a fire like that and is really what you want in your airplane. We use it in data centers, et cetera. It's non-corrosive. Now you gotta ventilate your cockpit very well because this sucks all the oxygen out of the air. That's what puts the fire out. So again, a friendly but serious reminder, make certain you're using the right fire extinguisher on any kind of aircraft fire. You're gonna have a lot more problems. Unfortunately for my friend with the uh, engine fire, there's so much dust in the firewall forward that the entire firewall forward is coming off and most everything will get replaced and obviously the engine will be thoroughly cleaned. Uh, it's a lot of work, okay? So uh, please don't do that. And then the second topic I'd like to talk about has to do with uh, jam nuts. <laughs> you know, it's been a long time since Vic has talked about jam nuts. I know that's what you're thinking. I wrote about them for a lot of years. We did videos on them, and I've kind of brought those to the foreflight over a number of years, forefront, I should say. And uh, most recently, I'm beginning to see, again, I would call it a plague of jam nuts. Uh, in the last couple of months, I've uh, done a DAR inspection on a couple of airplanes. Most recently, this last week on an RV-10, three loose jam nuts. Now you think, okay, how critical were they? Well, two of them were actually on the pitch control tube at either end. So that could be pretty serious. The problem that I see and I hear every time I go do an inspection is, oh, I've had all my buddies look at it or the AA chapter or the tech counselor, et cetera. Same words I heard this week. What I would encourage you to do is not get that false sense of security by having just everybody look at it, but find somebody who knows where to look. In these cases in the last few weeks, and especially the one just this week, 
Uh, use of torque seal was prevalent throughout the aircraft, made me so happy when I walked up to it. Every jam nut that was visible that I could see had torque seal on it. The key word is visible. I know where to reach and I know where to look. And these are hidden jam nuts on the control system that are down in the tunnel. You actually have to get in there, look at it with a flashlight and a mirror and move the control column around. And sure enough, there they were three proud jam nuts really loose. So, you know, I'm not here to tell you I'm smarter. I'm going to find more than anybody else. I really don't want to. My job as a DAR, I believe, is to give that aircraft the most thorough pre-flight it's ever going to have. Because a lot of these inspection panels may never be open again. Maybe once a year, okay? But if you haven't looked at them now when you're building, chances are you won't look at them down the road. So, again, I would encourage you, please find somebody who understands the aircraft you're building and knows where to look or get on the forums and ask around, right? You're just getting a false sense of security about that. Anyway, that's it on the two topics I wanted to talk about. A little bit of update on the RV-10. So in uh, this week, a little busy getting ready to go to Galesburg. So Galesburg is a national stearman fly-in, where actually it's the 54th uh, national fly-in. It's, it's up in Galesburg, Illinois. And uh, I've spent the week getting the Stearman really ready to go. It's all polished up, looking good, packed, some extra routine maintenance done on it. And a bunch of us from Atlanta, five or so, are leaving tomorrow morning, Friday. And uh, we'll be spending next week up there. So very much looking forward to it, although it does look like it's going to be a little chilly. Coming out of this 95-degree weather in Atlanta should be a pretty abrupt change. But uh, looking forward to it. The camaraderie up there is just wonderful. There aren't any vendors. There might be one or two for food and maybe a t-shirt vendor, but it's just all about the camaraderie. So if, you, if any of you are up that way and get a chance, I would encourage you to go to the Galesburg uh, National Stearman Fly-In. It's uh, averages about 55 to 75, maybe 80 Stearmans every year. In the 50th anniversary, we had 155. So it is like going back into a World War II training base. It's, it's pretty exciting. So back to the RB10, this week I did manage to get all the cutting done for the windshield. This is a big unwieldy piece. You've got to be careful moving it around so you don't crack it. And I also cut all of the uh, side windows. You can see ones down here on the floor. I'm trying to put them where they won't get damaged. We can go over here and look at... Uh... So these are all cut now. And the next step is to put spacers to kind of make them flush. And then I'm going to glue them all in with Sika Flex. We'll prime uh, the surfaces well. And uh, first we'll, you know, sand them with 80 grit or so and use the primer and Sika Flex and go those all in. I've also, one of the things I would encourage you to think about, I'm always thinking ahead about things that get in the way. If you look over here on the glare shield, before I put, the windshield in, I've done some of the work that makes it much easier with a drill here than trying to work with an angle drill once the windshield is in. So I've cut some breather holes that I use here. I just put snap rings in those to allow the hot air uh, to come out from under the panel. I have also drilled for the defrost fans right there. And uh, this is all bolted in now. So getting ready to prep this for the fiberglass work. Same thing, I will use Sika Flex here on this edge. And then we'll build this up with some, uh, you know, some West Systems epoxy mixed with some uh, micro balloons to blend it in. And then the layers of fiberglass over top of that. So we'll get right back on this. It's going to hopefully be cooler by the time I get back from Galesburg. And I'll be able to move this outside and get a lot of the sanding done, which I've kind of avoided doing in here. Anyway, thanks for listening. And uh, thanks for all the kind words regarding the interview with uh, Jimmy Broad last week. Uh, so uh, we'll probably do more of those interviews. Maybe I'll even consider doing some while we're up at uh, Galesburg and highlight some of the really interesting people in our aviation sector. Thanks for watching.